The following is an analysis, interpretation, and summary of James Clear's book, Atomic Habits. Chapter 16, how to stick to a good habit every day. So in the last video, we talked about the rule of behavior change and how we can make abstaining from habits rewarding and gratifying. How we can incentivize habits and then how we can build to sustain them. And that's what we're gonna dive into a bit more right now in some strategies that we can do to consistently sustain habits when we know we just haven't been as consistent. Okay, what can we do? So this strategy called the paper clip strategy. So there's a story of a salesman who after each sales call moved one paper clip from the, a full jar to an empty jar. Every morning he would start with 120 paper clips in one jar and would keep calling until he had moved all 120 paper clips to the second jar. This guy was making the equivalent of 125,000 a year as a 24 year old. You know, back in uh, when this story was done, I believe a few decades ago. So pretty good. You know, he used this strategy to help keep himself accountable. If you're a writer, you could do this for every page you write or do it for every set of an exercise you complete. You know, you could move, it could be anything. You could bring two little jars, you could, you could have um, on your wrist, you could have a bunch of elastic bands and you could move one to the other side of your wrist. In fact, actually, Jerry Seinfeld employed a similar technique with joke writing. Some people are quite familiar with this. It's about the calendar. He had a calendar. He would try and write jokes every day. And he put a red X on the calendar. And his goal was to not break the chain. He would write jokes every day. And for those who have seen Jerry, or at least a documentary on him, maybe would have seen him put, like at some point uh, in Comedians and Cars Getting Coffee, he put all his journals of his, of his joke diaries. I can't really believe if that's what he called it, but, and he put it all on the ground and it was just a full pavement and road littered with pieces of paper of all these jokes. And you think, man, that must have, t how much, that is such a huge amount of work right there sitting on the ground. Jerry was able to do that in part because he employed strategies like this to incentivize his behavior and manage and measure his behavior, the red X on the calendar. If you have a habit you're trying to, you're trying to deploy and create, get your calendar, make it visible and make it something physical and visceral where every time you do something good for yourself uh, with a habit, there is a clear from one thing to the other, you're moving one piece of the of the chessboard to the other side of the chessboard. It gives you some type of satisfactory feeling. And here it is, making progress is satisfying and visual markers like paper clips or calendars provide clear evidence of progress while reinforcing your behavior and adding immediate satisfaction. I did this when I was in a very aggressive caloric deficit, uh, I was just trying to get as lean as possible, push my bodies and mind to a level of excellence they had never attained. Just get goddamn ripped, right? In in in, in all uh, br uh, meathead and meathead language for you, okay? And I did, and it taught me a lot about my my mind, what my mind was capable of. But when things got difficult, I employed this strategy. I had two jars. Those can see some Lego behind me. Uh, as a kid, I'd build Lego, Lego. That's what I built as a kid. And so what I did, I had two little glass jars. They were see-through, hence the glass. I put, for how many days I had left on this certain phase, I put uh, 30 Lego bricks in one. Every day I'd pass, there would be one with a black lid, one with a gold lid. The black lid was uh, today, the, the, the future, potential. The gold was the past. Every time a day passed, I'd put one Lego brick into the gold jar and I could see visual progress that I was inching closer and closer to my end of the phase, which was getting very challenging mentally. You know, just if you want to know, go to strengthofsard.com. I'll put an article up there or you can just go to my Instagram as well or YouTube. It's all up there. Anyway, that helped. It helped give me like when things get really difficult, it, you don't know and if you don't know when things are going to end that is that's that's a it's a big psychological torture and it plays on your mind if you don't know when when there's an end coming and at some points I didn't know so I had to create the, these phases for myself working with my coach to create phases and to 
give myself a visual marker of, of tracking. It, it was very important for my <laughs> my mental to keep me sane, to keep me keep me moving forward. Let's talk about habit tracking and how it's so powerful. See, habit tracking leverages multiple laws of behavior change. It makes behaviors obvious, attracting attractive and satisfying all at once. Benefit one, habit tracking is obvious. Recording your last action create a trigger that can initiate your next action. It builds a series of visual cues that reminds you to act again. For example, when you look at your food diary, your MyFitnessPal, whatever, you're reminded of the next meals that you plan to eat, which mitigates any deviation from your plan. I don't have deviation from my plan unless I choose to. Because my, my business gets monitored. My food, my weight, psychology. The markers that are important, my, my, what I look like, body composition. I'm, I'm speaking quite health-wise and physical-wise because it's a big focus of mine right now. Um, when you try and, as Socrates says, it's a shame for a man to grow old without seeing the beauty for which his body is capable of. I'm going to see what I'm capable of. So these tools help track, help remind you of what's next, what you've done, and keep you accountable to the parameters and boundaries that you've set for yourself. Keeps us honest. Because most have a distorted view of their behavior. We think and we, we think we act better than we do. Measurement is one method to overcome our ignorance and delusion to our own behavior. And when the evidence is right in front of us, we are less likely to lie to ourselves. It provides visual proof that you are casting votes for the type of person you wish to become. And that is deeply satisfying. I uh, have never measured more things in my life. And some people think it's rigid, it's structured, it's obsessive, and it's like, heck, it's, uh, they just get very, like, some people get turned off by it because they think it's restrictive. But like Jocko says, discipline equals freedom. And I think structure equals freedom. And I think accountability equals freedom. It, ca it makes me more adherent. It, I can progress faster more effectively, more efficiently, if I know what's going on. If I know, I'm gonna give you 100 coins, okay? I'm gonna give you an example. 100 coins is all you get for the month, but I'm not gonna tell you how much anything costs. You're just gonna to have to like guess, like you use your best guess to see how much things cost when you go out and buy things. Okay, well, oh, that's that'll be 20 coins, sir. Oh, really? Oh, that's how much, I, oh, okay. Oh, that'll be 10 coins and you go, and now your coins are out. Your coins are done. You've spent all your coins because you didn't know how much stuff costs. And this is analogous to people's lives. They don't know how much the actions they are doing cost them in the long term. You don't know how calorically dense that food or drink beverage is when you consume it in abundance with everything else. Oh, one year later, oh, I've overspent. I'm now overweight. I'm now obese. Diabetes, blood pressure, 50 years old, oh no, now, now I have early, early signs of Alzheimer's and dementia. For those who don't think it's linked, it is linked. Um, they're calling Alzheimer's type 3 diabetes for a reason. Uh, we're not going to get into that though, that's strength of sad business. And then you, you come to a point where just, like, destructive outcomes are at your doorstep. And you're like, how did I get here? Oh my god, look at my life, I'm so stressed. Oh, I'm not doing things to fulfill me. Uh, I'm, I'm surrounding myself with, uh, you know, uh, like emotional people. I'm on social media all day. I don't feel good. It's like, there's a reason for it. Where's your time going? Oh, you don't know. You never measured your time. You don't know where you're spending it. You don't get any of it back. You, you, with money, you can, you can make it more efficient. You can buy convenience. You can buy things that save you time. But where's that time going? You don't know because you haven't measured it because you never had a calendar. How, how are you going to form and manage habits? If you're just guessing, random actions get random results. That's what a lot of people do. So measuring enables us to manage it. What it gets measured, gets managed. Was that Peter Drucker? Pretty successful guy. Might be onto something. And it doesn't even take much. It depends on the standard you have for your life, really. Habit tracking and, you know, it has so many benefits. But it's like, depends on the life you want to live. Depends on the standard you want to live by. Maybe you're fine. You're probably not fine if you're watching videos like this. If, if, you're, if you're, what are we in? If you're 16 videos deep into Atomic Habits, you're probably not content with your life. You're probably looking for more. So you probably should start measuring and managing. Just try it out. Google Calendar. It's your best friend. Hell, Jordan Peterson preaches on it too. 
I hope he makes a call. Let me try and make a call right now. You can be in control of the asset you will never get back, time. Try and manage your life like it's not your own. Manage your money like you're trying to manage it for someone else. Treat yourself like someone you cared for. Feed yourself as well as you feed your pet. Hopefully you feed it well. Some people treat and feed their pets at a much healthier state than they treat themselves. Behave as if you're the type of person that you are, you want to be. Like, what would that type of person be? Maybe you look up to guys like LeBron James or Aubrey, or, uh, like Aubrey, uh, like Drake. You know, you look up to them as m these musicians and you're like, man, look at their work ethic and their, their, their success and their accolades and their influence and their power and like, look at all the things that they've done. And what would they do? What would they do to get to where they are now? To get to where they, di they got? Because where they are now is, <sighs> people get messed up. They look at people like Dwayne Johnson. They look at people like Rogan. They look at people like Lex Friedman. And, and they'll, they'll look at like, these intellectuals, Peterson, will look at these guys and girls and will see them for what they are now. But what they are now, what got them, they're at the dance now. You gotta see what got them to the dance. What actions and behaviors got them to the dance? How can you learn from that? Maybe they're not doing everything that got to them to dance right now because they're sustaining. You're building, I'm building in many ways. So I have to exhibit different habits. That's where managing and measuring can become very valuable. You hold yourself accountable to yourself. Oh, it's like I'm trying to sell the idea of accountability and tracking and I don't get anything for it. It's like I am selling you something that I, <laughs> I'm selling you something that only benefits you. But I feel so strongly about it because it's transformed my life. Managing my time more effectively. Like I own my time now. My boundaries are clear. I feel great. My energy, my vitality, my vigor, my strength, mental and physical. It's not an accident. I designed this life for years of carving away at the stone and I still got plenty way to go. But part of that, like part of one of those pillars was like I had to measure shit. I had to measure it so I could manage it. My time, my money, my money. You don't know how much money's coming in your account. What are you talking about? How can you say you want to live a life of freedom and flexibility and financial security and independence? You don't even know how much money's coming in and out. You want to buy that couch? How? 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 That's how, way. how are you going to buy the things you want? You want to buy your parents a house or a car? Tell me how. How? That's how way. Oh, until I save up enough money. When? You don't know. You can't tell me. You can't tell yourself. Because you don't know how much money's coming in and out. Maybe you know the in. Do you know the out? Because let me tell you, we could make the in seven figures, eight figures coming in. But if your expenses outweigh your income, it don't matter. Just like if the calories are higher than that output, then it doesn't matter. You're gonna gain weight. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God, people go crazy. People messed up, people got messed up. What do you expect? Oh, you're broke for a reason. You're not a victim. You're not a victim. Some people are legitimate victims, but most of the people watching this are probably not. Stop acting like one. Get your business together. Start recording all the money that comes in and all the money that comes out. I have a Google Sheet spreadsheet that I record every dollar that comes in and out. I do it on my phone. It takes me five seconds every purchase. I got recurring expenses. I duplicate the I duplicate the 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 sheets. It's very it's 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 automated right now. If you own a business, you know this life. You know you have to measure stuff. Otherwise, you're in trouble. If you don't know how many clients are coming in and out, that you need to know. Probably the three biggest things to measure. Well, actually, let's go money in and out. Then you can compare to what's worked. Money, nutrition, sleep, training, health. Find ways to, your time. Measure those things. Do not have to do it forever. No one's forcing you to do it forever. You do it for a period of time. You learn things about yourself that you will never unlearn, that will serve you for the rest of your life. I have this great skill now where I can probably relatively accurately tell you the energy content of most foods and the weight of most foods cooked or raw, if you just, or cooked, I should say, if you just put it on a plate in front of me. 
that's valuable for me to then have that skill set when I need to manage my own health and weight and vitality when I'm away from my home. I know the consequences of certain foods on my health, on my brain, on my body. I know the conse- like I know how much I need to budget money things. I know my routine with my sleep and, and like how much I can afford to deviate. And then I can be flexible because I have knowledge, I have information. That's where it happens. When the information frees you to make free and more flexible decisions, I won't keep going. I just too much. You guys get it. Benefit two, habit tracking is attractive. Progress sparks people to keep moving forward. In this way, habit tracking can have an addictive effect on motivation to progress. Each small win feeds your desire. When you're feeling down, it's easy to forget about all the progress you've made. Habit tracking provides visual proof of all your work and a reminder of how far you've come. Look at all the money you've saved. Look at all the weight you've lost. Just look back. You're concerned about, oh my God, I haven't made progress. Oh, look at me now. I've, I've fluctuated. I haven't made much money. Look at what's happened over the last six months. Don't make an emotional decision now. Look at what's happened. Look at the average trends of what's been occurring. You can see trends if you measure. Benefit three, habit tracking is satisfying. Tracking can become its own form of dopamogenic reward. It's satisfying to cross something off a list, complete the task you said you would. You get focused on the day-to-day process rather than the macro result. And so the process becomes the result and focus. You're not fixated on getting a six pack or making six figures. You're just trying to keep the streak alive of training X times a week or saving $100 a week and sticking to your meal plan or sticking to your budget. And you become the type of person that doesn't want to miss training or doesn't uh, miss sticking to your budget or, or, or doesn't or rewards themselves for abstaining from eating out three times a week. Now, here's the downside to tracking, okay? Because there is downside to tracking. It can feel like a chore because it creates two habits, the habit you're trying to build and the habit of tracking it. Counting calories sounds like a hassle when you're already struggling to stick to your diet. That's why you don't have to do it to begin with. Work at the big rocks first, the foundational pillars. But here's to make how to make it easier. Make it automated. Smartwatch, Fitbit, O-ring, record sleep, activity, steps. You don't do nothing, just put it on. Live your life. Google Photos records your travels and memories and gives you nostalgic reminders. Now you can have something to improve your relationship because I want to improve my relationship with friends and family. I want to make them feel like I'm remembering them and I'm reaching out to them. Great. Now, are you going to plan sitting down to go through your photos every month and compare them to, oh, that was a year ago, that was three years ago? Don't have to. Google Photos will do it for you and it'll make collages for you. How good is that? As long as you don't mind having all your photos and videos available for on the archive, in the cloud, then there's a great way to connect with people, improve your relationships. So you can make tracking easier. You know, there's, these apps like FitnessPal, they make it easier when you can just scan barcodes of things and you can just go bang, done. Anyway, you set a reminder every week or month to review and input the data into a spreadsheet over five, 10, 15 minutes. You don't have to do it every day. You might just sit down at the end of a month and put all your income and expenses. You might sit down at the end of the month and do and collate all your, your nutrition or your health or your body weight, blah, blah, blah. But here's the thing, you want, to, you want to manually track your most important single habit instead of sporadically tracking 10. I got to the point where I can uh, juggle seven balls in the air because I juggled one to start with and then two and then three and then 10. One, pick one. You want to do 10, pick one. How about that? Show yourself you can do one then two. Don't compare yourself to me or him or her. You'll get there. I got there and here from the same process, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Record each measurement after the habit occurs. The completion of the behavior is the cue to write it down. This allows you to combine habit stacking with habit tracking. After, and this is the equation. After current habit, I will, so you're gonna stack something, plus track current habit. After I put my dishes in the sink, while I'm eating, I'm going to record what I ate. Bam. While you're eating, you couple it. You stack it with something. 
You don't have to remind yourself because it's inbuilt into the behavior of the cue. The behavior is the cue. But I said you could do it at the end of a month if you schedule it in, if you create a pre-commitment implementation intention. If you do not, then it could be more valuable to you on the day-to-day to do it right after the task is done or during the task, like after the set is complete, put the reps and sets in the tracker. You're much more likely to do it than if you waited until after the session is done. Now, to finish off, two last points. How to recover quickly when your habits break down. Aiming for perfection sets most people up for failure. So instead, consider this philosophy. Never miss twice in a row. Anybody can have a bad day. The most successful people who fail are the best at rebounding quickly from their slip up back into their habit again. So the breaking of the habit doesn't have as much influence if the reclaiming of it is fast. You can make the mistake, just get up quick. And, tr- and 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 don't stay on the ground, but get up quick. After a habit breaks down, maybe it's binge eating, maybe it's addictive behavior. You go back to smoke. You go back. You doing. You do back to doing ice again, cocaine again, drinking again. Lower your expectation. Get back into your routine. Even if you, but this lower the expectation is the big thing. Even if you can't complete the, your routine habit as well or as completely as you would like, that's okay. You don't have to do the whole 60 minutes. You can do 10. Just because you don't have a 90-minute or 60-minute block available to write or read doesn't mean you need to wait for that next block to come. Drop the expectation. Just show up for like half or the third of the originally planned time so you can rebuild the momentum of getting back into the habit. That's really big because people are going to be like, oh, I fell off the wagon and it's too intimidating to get back up because I now have to carve out all this time again. No, don't. Five minutes. One minute. Ten seconds. People think I'm joking. It's not hyperbole. It's real. You pick up the book. You read one page. Read half a page. Do something. You're listening to this. Why can't you do that? You're doing something. You know you can do something productive for yourself. You know damn well you can go ahead and read that book, write that paper. You got a whole paper. I've read, I've written plenty of research papers. Plenty, right? It can be intimidating when you are like, oh God, all right, 2,000, 3,000 words. I'm gonna spend two dozen hours researching and reading papers. I'll write you that. I'm looking at the big intimidating task. How about this, motherfucker? Don't even look at that. Go find one paper and highlight the main points in just one of them. And then you're done. Turn up tomorrow and do another one. That's it. Just do one a day. If I said to you, you got to read 20 papers and summarize them all, you'd be like, really? Oh my God, I don't want to do that. Don't say that to yourself then. Tell yourself one. And then tell yourself you're going to do it again tomorrow. Just tell yourself one, 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 one. Aggregation of marginal gains. What happens after 20 days? You got 20 papers. It's almost like I care about this stuff. Sometimes lost days can hurt you more than successful days can help you. Sometimes lost days can hurt you more than successful days can help you. If you start with $100, make $50, you have 50% gain. You now have $150. But now you only need a 33% loss to take you back down to $100. So a 33 loss is just as meaningful or valuable than achieving a 50% gain. How interesting. This is why bad workouts on days you don't feel motivated can be some of the most important ones from a habit-building perspective. Just by showing up and providing the body with the appropriate stimulus and showing yourself you can... You can uh, do the habit, you can maintain the compounding gains you've accrued from the previous weeks and months. Sticking to your diet on the days where they're most difficult can often be the pivotal straw that helps you. You don't want to allow yourself to put up zero on the scoreboard. Score at least once. Do something. 
It's not about the workouts or the habit itself. It's about being the type of person that is consistent and doesn't miss whatever you're trying to do. It's about being the type of person that represents health and excellence. I'm the type of person that is consistent. I did write that about myself, I believe. And the health and excellence is another thing that I identify with. There's going to be plenty of people who are smarter and stronger than me. I recognize that. I'm, I'm, I can't outlift you all. I can't. But here's the thing. You might, out, you might be faster. You might be more conditioned. You might be smarter. You might have more letters behind your name, but you were, you were damn sure not more consistent than me. It's very unlikely. Very unlikely. And that's a part of my identity. Like, that's not me better than you. We can play it like that, but it's more like, that's very important to me. It's more important to me to be consistent than for me to put up 100 on the scoreboard. Now, I'm going to try and do both. But if I can do one thing, it's going to be the consistent. No matter how I feel. I can do something. If I can look up, I can get up. Why can't you? Last point. Knowing when and when not to track a habit. Example. The mind wants to win the game that's being played. We focus on working long hours and little sleep instead of quality, purposeful, deliberate, focused work. We care more about accumulating steps than becoming a healthy person in totality. We teach for standardized tests instead of teaching for learning, critical thinking, curiosity, solving problems. So we optimize for what we measure and when we choose the wrong measurement, we get the wrong behavior. So be careful about what you're measuring. You don't just want to know how many people are signing up to your course. How many finish your course? Because you've got people in the door, but how many of lives have actually been changed? How many become qualified at the end of your course or your degree? This is why we can't just measure or judge based off one metric. You may not notice the scale move in the direction you want, but you may notice you actually feel and look better. That's pretty good. So we need to monitor a wide berth of parameters to get an honest overview. That's what I believe. But you start at one. And you be careful that measuring the behavior just doesn't become the thing in of itself and doesn't establish a unhealthy relationship with the behavior and outcome that you're trying to improve. This can easily happen with body weight, with nutrition, with health particularly. Even uh, I haven't seen so much with money or time. That to me is a net. Po they're all net positive for most people, but health metrics can be more sketchy due to underlying psychological issues. That's a separate topic, but this right here, oh, it's so important. Like tracking, measuring, what gets measured, gets managed. Don't miss twice in a row. Rather be consistent than perfect and intense. Automate your tracking to make it easier. Hire somebody. A lot of you can hire, have the means to hire people. Hire somebody to help manage your, the, the measurements that you're trying to track. Make it satisfying. So you have something at the end of the task you do, you stack it, and then you measure it directly after or even during the task, so you don't forget to measure it. You purchase the good. Oh, your phone's out, you're purchasing. I'm automatically opening up my, my Google Sheet. I'm putting it in there. Done. And you wanna make it obvious. So you use that last action to create a trigger to initiate your next action. Visual cues, the paperclip strategy, the Lego bricks I did. Jerry Seinfeld did the X on the calendar. Measuring time, money, health are the big 
three that if all people measured at least for a period of six to 12 months in their life, they would gain a greater grasp on their potential as a human being to progress more effectively and more efficiently to become the person they wanted, do the things they wanted and live the life that they wanted at a faster, more effective rate if they begun measuring the metrics for the outcomes and the person and the values that are important to them. Next chapter is on accountability partners. Stay tuned for that. You'll most likely be audio out by the time you watch this. There is a playlist on my channel where all the book playlists are, which you can go through and watch one at a time. You do not have to watch everything at once. Here's an example. Maybe you pick one video a day. I'm going to dedicate to self-learning. I'm going to take notes and I'm going to take one action off. And then you're done. You've taken that one action from this video. You come back tomorrow. You do another, take another action. You know, maybe once a week. Maybe that's even too much. You don't need to overwhelm yourself by 20 different actions in 20 different days. 20 weeks. Do it over 20 weeks if you need to. It's fine. All the plates are up there. I've done book summaries and a whole bunch of books like behind me, 12 Rules for Life, 48 Laws of Power, How to Influence and Influence People, Sapiens, the books that have impacted me the most. Link All links below in the description at Alexander Emanuel. All uh, platforms, Instagram is where I am more active and where I encourage people to go. Otherwise, thank you for watching. Subscribe, hit notifications so the uh, our friend Google and YouTube can... Uh, you know, you can see these videos without being, without missing them. Thank you.